Hello and welcome to the first programme in a new series called Wood Works. My name is John Hall and I'll be your host for these programmes which will be centred around master woodworkers in Santa Cruz County and on the Central Coast. These are craftsmen and artists who have chosen wood as the medium through which to express their creativity, their artistry and their skills. So let's make a start with today's programme. We are delighted to be joined by Matthew Werner. Welcome Matt to the first programme. Thank you, delighted uh, to have you here. So perhaps we can start with the, the most basic of questions. Why woodwork? Why woodwork? It's a great question. Um, it's a, a second career for me, uh, at least the second career. I've got a background in the natural sciences. I uh, went through a PhD program in soil biology, soil ecology, which led to doing f uh, um, research, field research on organic farming, which is what got me to Santa Cruz. Uh, spent 10 years at the university doing that work. And somewhere along the line, we bought this house. And that, that's kind of the starting point for my entry into woodwork. Mm -hmm. Uh, this, I guess it was early 90s, early mid 90s, we bought this house and it needed a lot of work. It's a, it's a early 1900s house. And my partner, Michelle, uh, had a stepfather who had passed away, left a shop full of tools and she got it in her head that uh, we would probably need those tools mm -hmm. in uh, the course of working on this house. And I had no interest at the time. I was working as a researcher, I was also uh, well, both of us were working sort of semi-professionally as musicians, and I felt that uh, woodworking and the risks involved with working with power tools was too much of a danger. I didn't want to risk uh, injuring my hands. I was mm -hmm. a guitarist, a mandolinist. Mm -hmm. But she came back with a, a truck full of uh, table saw and routers and various other sharp mm -hmm. tools and parked them in the garage and uh, closed the door on that, and I, and I thought, you know, that was that, that, that this would be stuff that she'd be working with. But mm -hmm. there was a draw there for me. I kept thinking about things that I could do with wood. I'd always been fascinated with wood. Um, I remember a time when I was quite young and my father's pointing to a piece of wood. It was a, maybe a piece of trim or something and, and giving a name like this is pine. And, and me looking at that and thinking, well, how does he know that? It, to me, it looked just the same as every other piece of wood in the house. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until I s got into the shop and started working with wood and started noticing that every type of wood has its own characteristics, its own smells and textures and colors and so on, that I started realizing, well, you can actually tell mm -hmm. pine from oak, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. when I was a little kid, you know, was a mystery to me. Mm -hmm. So you started with projects around the house? I started with safety because of this, this uh, concern about not injuring myself. I, Good place to start. She had brought home uh, boxes of books and, and old fine woodworking magazines and mm -hmm. so on. And I started going through all these magazines and, and looking for the stories about mistakes people had made. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I working when I was hungry or I was working when I was angry and I did this or I did that and just studying the injury and the accident process so that I could educate myself to know what not to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started going to uh, shops that had bins outside of scraps and I'd bring home all these little scraps mm -hmm. of various hardwoods and I'd make tiny little boxes out of them. Very coarse crude little things but I'd proudly show them to people. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend who uh, looked at these things and, and uh, was encouraging about them and said, I've got this stack of books written by this guy named Jim Krenoff, and, and here, you need to read these books. Somehow he made it, he thought that there would be a connection for me. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I, I went through these books, and uh, there's three of them, and just absorbed them you know, like a sponge. and learned as much as I could from this interesting fellow who at the time was was working and writing in Sweden and this inspired me more and and yes gradually it led to a, a house remodel and 
building all the cabinets in the house and doing all the trim work and getting some hands-on experience and also having excuses to buy more tools mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. gradually outfit a shop because we were doing a lot of the work ourselves. Mm -hmm. So when did you get into the more of the fine woodworking that you're into now? Well, at some point, uh, I remember clearly r looking through a fine woodworking magazine because by now I was subscribing to it and seeing a, an ad in the back for a fine woodworking program in Mendocino, mm -hmm. actually in Fort Bragg, just above Mendocino, run by Jim Cranoff. And, and I almost fell off my chair because here's the guy who I was considering by this time my teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, through these books and figuring that he was in Sweden, I would never meet the guy. And he was just a five hour drive north of here. And so um, I filled out the little card and sent it in saying I'm in interested in getting more information. Mm -hmm. And the brochure came back and I remember clearly still sitting down at the dinner table looking at this brochure and saying, this is what I'm going to do. Because although I had been working in, in the university, f I'd been came to Santa Cruz in 1988 and was doing research uh, at the time. So I had been eight years here doing that work. Um, I had always been looking for something more creative that I could do. And we were doing music semi-professionally, but, but that's a tough road to hoe. Mm -hmm. um, but somehow the idea of, of woodworking just really clicked for me. Mm -hmm. And I remember making the decision, this is what I want to do. And then it taking several months for, for me to kind of wrap my head around what I had just decided to do, because there's a huge change. Yeah, and Mendocino is, uh, is a long commute on a daily basis. Yeah, well, it, it's not a daily commute. Exactly. What ended up happening is I, I applied. I mm -hmm. didn't get in the first year. Mm -hmm. uh, I went up that summer and spent a week or two. They have short summer classes and sort of got to know the staff and they got to know me. And then the second year I applied again and that's when I got in. Mm -hmm. So I went up there in 98 and I spent a year there and it, it's, a, it's a six day a week, eight to five program. There's no commuting back to Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a challenging year because uh, my family stayed here and I went up there and, and rented a room mm -hmm. and we had to make little rendezvous. We'd, we'd meet in Petaluma mm -hmm. for, for brief weekends in between. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, six days a week in the shop for a full academic year because it's a, it's a program run through College of the Redwoods mm -hmm. and uh, got to study with the man himself, Jim Cranoff. So what was it like working with him? Uh, it was fantastic. I learned uh, an awful lot. Um, and it's not just that I got to, to study with him um, because Jim would teach two days and then there were two other teachers who were former students of his who would teach two days each. Um, so I had three different teachers plus the shop foreman who, would, who were full of experience and ideas. And then there were two dozen students and each one had a unique background. Um, some were, were builders coming into the fine furniture trade. Uh, one woman was a designer from Bombay who wanted to mm -hmm. learn how to work with her hands a little bit more. Uh, just a really diverse group who, you know, if you got stuck on something, you could just go from bench to bench and say, well, what do you think? Mm -hmm. and, and get all kinds of ideas. So it was a, it was a rich environment, and uh, I soaked up as much as I could. And uh, since I came back in 99, I've been full-time as mm -hmm. a furniture maker. That, that program gave me the confidence and the, the foundation to say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a furniture maker. Mm -hmm. And you can pay me for my work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, sounds great. Sounds wonderful. So tell us what type of what type of uh, work you're involved in, or have been since since you came back from the uh, the College of the Redwoods. What what are your specialities? Well, the, I would say I've developed uh, the specialty in doing marquetry, which is a particular type of inlay, mm -hmm. uh, creating images on wood using wood. And uh, most of the work that I do includes some marquetry. And so I'm doing f mostly furniture pizza pieces uh, from headboards and footboards for beds to tables and chairs and cabinets. And mm -hmm. I do a music stand that's kind of a special piece that I designed. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes also just wall panels that contain some of the marquetry imagery, just a way to show off the, the, the marquetry. Mm -hmm. 
I do the design work myself. Um, occasionally, I'll have a, a, a client who, who has a particular interest. Uh, for instance, I had a client who's a photographer, and he had taken a, a really beautiful picture of an egret. Mm -hmm. And that was the image that they wanted inlaid on their headboard. So I took his photo and, and developed a, a design from that. Um, most clients are more give me more leeway in terms of, of what the design will be. Um, so there's kind of a range from, from those have a really clister, cl crystal clear idea to mm -hmm. those that say, you're the artist, you designed me something, and, and I'm sure I'll love it. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. those, are the, those are the fun ones to, to work for. Mm. Is all of your work custom work? No. Um, and I would say ideally for me, there's a balance between custom work that's designed for someone where I know, you know this is going to have a home when it's done, there's going to be a paycheck when it's done, and then when that project's done, I, I like to go to a piece that's just of my own design, uh, what I call spec work. It's speculative. Uh, these are pieces that get placed in galleries or that I show at my shop during open studios each year in October. And those pieces either sell to someone who sees them and, and falls in love with them, or they generate commissions um, just by people seeing them and saying, I, li I like that, but I want something a little different. Mm -hmm. And now Matt's going to demonstrate the marquetry process. Well, typically my, my um, marquetry is being used on larger pieces of furniture. But um, I also do some smaller pieces that are nice ways to display some marquetry. Um, but they're also functional. This is used as a letter holder or a napkin holder. And so here's a couple examples, uh, a little bamboo design that I do. And you can see that, that these pieces are, they're, they're like three-eighths of an inch thick, but the actual marquetry work is done when this piece of wood is in veneer form. Um, so I have a few samples here, so you can see uh, that the veneers are about a sixteenth of an inch thick. And these are veneers that I cut myself on the bandsaw. It's called resawing, where I take a board, run it through the bandsaw, and slice off uh, these, which I call them veneers, but they're really more thin pieces of wood in contrast to a commercial veneer, which is a lot thinner. What, what type of wood do you use? Um, well, one of my favorite woods for the background of marquetry is uh, the native big leaf maple, which is what this is. It has nice colors, um, especially pieces that have a little bit of pattern or a little bit of uh, mineral streaking color to them, or in some cases spalting, which is where a fungus has gotten in there and added a little color. So this is a favorite background for me. And this piece you can see that it's got a little bit of ripple here and a little bit of pink color and, and various little shades of, of lighter colors. Forms a good background. The design that I'd like to work with is this bamboo stalk with a couple of leaves, very simple design. So I start with a drawing. And then, so the next step is to transfer the drawing onto the workpiece. So I'll position the six inch square where I want the design to be and give myself an outline. And you can see that I'm avoiding these uh, little areas of imperfection, little voids here that we don't want to use. All right, so I'll start by making sure I have a registration mark so that when I want to come back later and trace in the leaves, I'll be able to line the design up. And so I'm tracing the outlines of the bamboo stock. And so there, I think you can see that we've got the, the outline of the bamboo stock in place. So now for the actual woods that I'm going to use for inlay, I've got this selection of woods uh, this is a, a type of ebony, um, which I've sliced into veneers. And I'll use one of those for the stock. For the, the nodes in between, I like to use something a little bit lighter. So I've got this uh, sycamore, which has this nice mottled appearance. And I'll use that for the, the nodes in between. Basically, I'll be working from background to foreground. So pieces that are further away, I will do the inlay first, and then I'll, I'll work my way to pieces that are more in the foreground. So 
the piece where the inlay is coming from actually gets taped to the back. So we turn this piece over, we use some masking tape, tape it in place. And then I need an entry hole, which is where the uh, scroll saw blade will pass through. So I'll give myself an entry hole here. And I'm putting the entry hole in a place where I know I'm going to come back later and inlay this piece of ebony so that that hole will disappear. So now we'll uh, feed the scroll saw blade through this hole in the back. Feed the whole assembly onto the scroll saw. And now you can notice that the, the table of the scroll saw is tilted at an angle. And uh, this angle is very important because as I'm cutting the piece in this direction, I'll be moving the, uh, the whole wood assembly in this direction, um, the, the piece underneath, the inlay piece, is going to have beveled edges. And so that the piece underneath will be slightly larger than the piece I'm cutting out of the top piece of wood. And if I've got the angle just right, that piece will fit in snugly and there won't be any gaps. That's what I'm shooting for, is no gaps. The angle is a function of the thickness of the veneer and the thickness of the blade. So when I've cut that piece, I can uh, toss the waste and save the inlay piece. Okay, so now I have my two inlay pieces so I can remove the tape. And so I have a little bit of white glue that I'll use to spread on the edges. And before I do the glue, I just want to show you that this piece fits in from the back, and so it's snug with no gaps on the surface. It doesn't fit in from this side because remember, both the cut and the inlay piece have eight degree bevels on their edges. So they only fit from the, the back, and they don't fall through, and they have a nice snug fit with no gaps. So I can fit, I can spread a little bit of glue on the edges like so, just enough to hold it in place. I can feel that this this veneer is slightly thicker than the, the veneer I'm inlaying into, so it's a little bit proud. So I have a, a block plane here and I'll just level it off so that it's flush on top. It's a little proud on the back too. I'll often make the inlay veneers, veneers just slightly thicker so that if there's any discrepancy in, you know, if the angle isn't just perfect, um, there's enough extra to make sure that I get a nice tight fit. So now we've got these two little node places uh, in place. So the next, the next piece will be this, the dark stock, and that's what I want to use this ebony for. Wood, wood has graphics, the grain, um, uh, gives you opportunities to accentuate your design if you pay attention to it. With this design, I'm, I'm kind of considering that light is coming from this angle, so that uh, you would think that this side might be more in shadow and this side might be more in light. And so maybe if I can use this lighter band as this edge of the bamboo stalk and then some of these darker parts over here, it will help uh, give that illusion of there being some sunlight and there being some depth to the piece. So we'll set that piece aside and, and I lined it up just nicely so we've got some of this lighter lighter part of the ebony on the right on the edge and then darker on the, the other side. So now we've got our our bamboo stock all in place. And so we need to move on to the leaves. And one thing I find is useful in, in trying to make these images come alive is to try and convey a sense of, of movement. Um, so in this case, thinking about uh, there's a little bit of wind blowing in this direction. It's sort of flipping up this leaf a little bit, you know, so that things are interacting with, with nature and there's a little bit of movement going on. 
So I'm going to use uh, this yellow heart for a couple of these leaves and then use the darker acacia for a couple of the others. And I've got some overlap areas here. And I always try and create some overlap because it helps uh, with the illusion of three-dimensionality. It's also nice to create little shadow effects, and we can do that by using hot sand. Leaf. What I do, when I'm going to do sand shading, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put the, the piece in place without glue, and I'll give myself some pencil marks where I want there to be shadow. Take the piece out, and I've got this uh, pot of hot sand here, and this is just beach sand from the local beach. And uh, what I do is I dip the piece in, and we're trying to, to create a little bit of a shadow. We don't want to combust the piece. We don't want it to go up in flames. Um, but it's a little tricky procedure because um, when the piece is all done and glued up, we're going to sand it to uh, polish it up and level it. And in the process, we'll lose a little bit of the shadow. So I need to go a little further than I want the shadow to ultimately be. But you can see I'm creating a darker area at the base of that leaf. And it's also starting to smoke a little, so you can tell that it's getting quite hot. So what I usually like to do is take a little bit of water and a paper towel and just cool that piece off to stop the, uh, the burning process and also make it a little easier to handle. But there I've got my shadow. Now I can go ahead and glue that in place. This is called hot sand shading. It's, a, it's an old technique. Marquetry is an, is an ancient technique and it was developed in Europe during the Renaissance. Um, and they used this technique during that time as well. And there we have our leaf. And you can see when I overlap the next leaf, you'll have a little bit of a shadow there, which helps create depth. Now we have our finished piece and we want to, or I want to, glue it up to this piece of 3 8 inch plywood core. And when you're working with veneer, anytime you do one thing to one side of, of the plywood, you want to do the same thing to the other. So I have a piece of, uh, a scrap of cherry veneer which I'm going to put on the other side. So it's basically a sandwich. Veneer on one side, plywood in the middle, veneer on the other side. And we need a press in order to, to put consistent pressure over the entire thing while the glue is drying. With something this small, it's very simple just to take some scraps of plywood, and I, I like to use a couple layers because it helps uh, distribute the pressure. And so I've got a couple layers of plywood. I've got a layer of, of thick cardboard which helps distribute any irregularities in the surface, make sure every part of the work it has pressure on it. So a piece of cardboard, and it's not corrugated cardboard, it's the, uh, I don't know what you call it, press board or, or something, but uh, it's like an eighth of an inch piece of cardboard. A couple pieces of newspaper so that if any glue squeezes through the woodwork, you're not going to ruin the piece of cardboard, you can reuse that. A couple of pieces of paper, and then same thing on the other side. When you're gluing veneer, you never apply the glue to the veneer itself because uh, the glue contains moisture, obviously. So if you put moisture on one side, this, this part of the wood is going to start to expand while the other side doesn't, and pretty soon you'll have something like this, which is very hard to work with. So glue only goes on the plywood. And uh, I like to use this roller to distribute the glue. So, spread on some glue. We'll roll it around. And with this roller, you don't need to press, because if you press, you're just 
making puddles, but very light pressure, almost just the weight of the roller itself. And then take that and flip it, place it down on your veneer, and do the same on the other side. And we'll just make sure that this piece is centered on the plywood. And to keep things from moving around when I put it all in the press, I use a few pieces of blue tape. I use blue tape and not white tape because white tape, once it goes through the press, is very difficult to remove. The, uh, the stickum on the blue tape is not quite as aggressive and it's possible to remove it after you've pressed the work. So that's all ready to go. So we take our one half of the veneer press, put this in place. Take the other half, flip it over, and we've got our sandwich. And now I'm just using half a dozen of these shop clamps to apply pressure. So there, and then I generally would give a piece like that overnight to, uh, to set up. So that's the veneer press. So we've got a piece in the press. It needs to stay in the press for several hours. I've gone ahead and uh, pressed a piece ahead of time so that you can see what the finished work looks like. So, so here's a piece that we've, we've done the same. Sandwiched two pieces of veneer over a plywood core. Uh, I've pressed it, uh, let it sit overnight, taken it out, and I've uh, used a random orbit sander to clean up the surface. I've got the sander here and we'll just do the final pass. And uh, let's just put a finish on there because the, the first application of finish always brings out the, the colors of the wood. And in this case, I'm going to use a shellac finish. And, uh, You can get an idea of what the, the finished piece is going to look like. So that concludes our program today. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed being here with Matthew Werner. If you'd like any more information on us, the program, or Matthew, you can contact us or him at the website that you'll see on your screen. Thank you for watching. We hope you'll join us again.